here's Leonard. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Mobicon Academy episode about the Good Street Part 2. Uh, for all the Dutch viewers, I apologize for the Christmas tree here. I know it's not even Sinterklaas yet, but um, we're already getting into the Santa spirit, so you'll just have to forgive us. Uh, for the rest of the world, happy December, uh, almost the end of 2020. Um, so I hope you have a good month and good festive season. Um, now let's get started on the Good Street. Um, the Good Street, as you may have seen in episode one, uh, has been developed by Mobicon in, um, in cooperation with two other consultancy companies, Awareness, Bart E. Geter at Vies, uh, at Vies. Um, and it was funded by the ANWB, the Dutch uh, Car Association, basically, because they wanted a new approach to how we design our space. If you haven't watched the first episode, I do recommend watching that one um, before you watch this one. Uh, if you're watching live, please stay with us. I will explain the real fundamentals in a second. So first of all, uh, why the Good Street? Uh, why do we need a new way to organize our public space? Uh, the Netherlands is known for having, having good, well-designed streets, very safe facilities for people on bike or on foot. Uh, why would we even need to consider changing it all up and doing things in a very different way? And why would Automobile Association be interested in that? Uh, well, there's a few reasons. Um, first of all, it's getting busier in our cities. Even in cities in the Netherlands, the cities are growing. Uh, they started at a high point of a very urbanized country, but they're still attracting more and more people. Um, and in, even in the Netherlands, cycling is getting more and more popular. Some of the busier routes in Utrecht, for example, that already have a very high baseline, still see a year-on-year -year growth of about 8 or 9% in number of cyclists, which is crazy if you think about it. Uh, but that's really causing some problems in the bigger cities with over full bike lanes and uh, bicycle traffic jams and a, a re-evaluation of what public space should be about. Third, thirdly, the diversity of the vehicles is changing. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, but we also at the same time see that there's an increase in uh, fatalities among cyclists um, and other vulnerable road users. It's not as bad as maybe in other countries, um, but it's still, the trend is not necessarily positive anymore after decades of um, decline in fatalities. So something needed to be done. Um, so what I said before about the, the fleet is changing, the number of vehicles and the types of vehicles in our streets is uh, getting more varied. Uh, the number of bikes and number of electric bikes is increasing very rapidly, uh, but we also see the advent or, or the arrival of more micromobility devices. Um, not only the, the e-scooters or the, the bird or lime shared scooters that you might see in other cities, we don't have them in the Netherlands yet, um, but we do see a, a, a lot of variety of electric vehicles on our, on our streets, among them um, electrically charged or powered uh, cargo bikes for deliveries of parcels or groceries even. Um, uh, the e-bikes uh, have come up quite significantly in the last few years, uh, outpacing or outgrowing uh, regular bikes in their sales at the moment, uh, which is causing a lot more speed differential and differences in speed between vehicle users on the already busy and narrow bike paths. And finally, the, the, the scooters uh, in the last decade or so, the, the, the actual mopeds or ride-on scooters have grown significantly in the Netherlands, uh, so much that it's become a real problem. And they're now con considering banning um, the helmetless version, which we are unique in the world to have a helmetless version of these scooters, but um, they, they've become very popular also using the bike lanes. So all of that means there's more pressure. Um, there's more pressure on our bike networks and more pressure on our streets to deliver um, the, 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 the goods that we want. So to address that in an already busy street and an already quite separated style of, um, of infrastructure design with separated bike lanes, separated footpaths, and separated car lanes. Uh, what do we need to do? How do we find more space where we want it? Um, and that means we have to make some real choices. And the, the current framework for designing our streets just doesn't give us the right framework to allow us to make the, the, the varied um, types of choices that we can. <clears throat> So we need to make choices where we, where we have space for moving around, where we have space for moving from A to B through somebody's street, um, where we have uh, space for staying when you want to hang out with your neighbors, when your children want to play. Uh, but also, very importantly, uh, where do we have space for parking? And that's not parking for cars necessarily. Uh, we've got that mostly under control in a lot of places. Um, but parking for bikes, uh, for example, is still a hot topic in many of our cities. 
Um, so the good street is a more comprehensive design method or, or approach to getting to making sure that all of these functions um, have a, a place in the street without compromising the place value of the of the environment or the public space. So you can say it's a, it's a structural examination of the design of public space and the choices required therein. So I highlighted three words. Uh, the structural examination means that you have to have a, a very ordered framework on how you think about the, the, the space and place uh, that, you're, that you're designing for, that you want to make a decision on. Um, it's about the design of public space, so we don't necessarily talk about private space or places that people can restrict access to. Um, and it's very much focused on the choices that, we, that are required. Um, it's not easy to, to make Dim or meet all the demands on, on space. So we have to make some choices, but to make choices and to allow politicians, for example, to make choices, you have to get them the right framework to think about these, um, these things. Um, and that means you have to think, uh, to, to find that balance and to find that place, um, the, the, the room for all the people to move, but also people to, to enjoy the place where they're in, you have to think about various levels. Um, you have to balance place and flow um, so a place for staying and playing and meeting your neighbors and exchange, the whole basis of what our cities are, are designed for. Um, on, and on the other hand, you have the flow, uh, moving of goods, moving of people, uh, which is what's currently dominating most of our public space. Um, so we need a new balance for that. But that balance can only be found if you address the issue both at a network level and at a local level. And I've got a little example. Um, at the network level, so really zooming out, um, going to the higher level of, of evaluating not just the one street but the whole area, evaluating what types of networks are running through the, the, the space that you're talking about um, and um, addressing any issues at that level first. That's very important. Before you start addressing the challenges at the local level. What we see overseas often is that we've um, people throw us a design challenge saying, oh, we need um, 12,000 vehicles a day. We definitely need parking, we need loading zones, we need bus stops, uh, we need accessible footpaths, and oh yeah, we also need a cycleway, but we have 20 meters of right of way. Well, you know that's not gonna work. That's just not gonna fit. So you need, uh, you need to be able to make choices, but to make those choices, you have to be able to give, give people the right framework to think about these choices. Otherwise, they'll say, all of these demands are num numerically set, they're very important, um, so we need to stick to them. Um, and that doesn't work. So that's why we need to zoom back out to the network level. Um, and what I said earlier about the balance between place and flow, you can see it um, indicated here with the, the, the two images on the left, a market, which is the exchange, uh, which is the whole reason that we have cities in the first place. And on the right hand side, um, the motorways, sorry, I'm just gonna have a sip of water, which are just flow places where you can only have flow and no exchange. You can, imagine, <clears throat> you can imagine that on the right-hand side, once there is an exchange, it's usually a car crash and it doesn't end well. Then, um, to, to get to the, 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 design or the, yeah, the design framework about the choices that we have to make, there's a few fundamentals that are very important that are really underpinning this approach. So the first one is safety. Um, it's a non-negotiable, uh, places need to be safe, places are not safe enough, even, if the, in, <clears throat> even in the Netherlands. Um, and that's, that's just a fundamental starting point from safety. Then secondly, uh, places need to be livable because you, can't, you, you can have a city that's perfectly accessible but not livable and then you've really not designed your places very well. They need to be accessible, which means that they're accessible to people of all ages and abilities and not just for the, the, the brave and the fearless, for example, or, and not just for the, the, the daily commuter that drives in and out. Um, and the, the, the design, choices that we make need to be complete and coherent. So it's not just about traffic, but it is about getting all of those other aspects in. Uh, and to do that, we have a, a design method. Now, this diagram might seem intimidating, um, and it is fairly complicated, but it is very important that you um, take, uh, take some time to read it. Uh, it is available for download within the Mobicon Academy Downloads website. Um, so I would definitely recommend downloading the report and looking at this a little bit closer, but we'll go through some of the steps today. All right, <clears throat> so an example. 
um, in this methodology, the first step you do, which you can, um, which I highlight in the, in the previous slide, the place assessment is the first step. Um, and you start to look at the identity of the place that we're talking about. And within a city, you have various zones. There's, a, for example, a residential area, uh, which can be the suburbs or any inner urban residential area. Um, you have the city center, where there's a lot of exchange, shops, businesses. Uh, you can have a park zone, a school zone, but it is not, it's not regimented. So there is diff different types of zones you can identify. There's a lot of differences between residential areas, for example, uh, that might have different functions. There's a lot of multi-use areas. Um, so this is not strictly these four zones. But if once you've identified the, the type of zone you're talking about and the identity of that place, then afterwards you can find uh, a speed that is appropriate um, for moving through that space. So for example, if it's a park, it will be really inappropriate to travel at 50 kilometers an hour through a park because it just um, has so many negative effects on the, on the function, the core function or the core identity of the park. Uh, same goes for a city center. Uh, often now we see a lot of busy 50 kilometer, 30, 30, 35 mile an hour streets through a city center, um, when really the city center is the core uh, it's the core of the city and that the city was built on the purpose of exchange. So fundamentally, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have people travel through a place that's built for exchange to travel through that at very high speed because speed and exchange are not, um, you cannot have them at the same place. They're not. No, I can't, I can't hear that. Melissa's trying to help me. I'm looking for the word, can't, can't find it. Compatible. <clears throat> compatible, thank you. They're not compatible. Um, so then, um, once we've established these fundamental principles and a very high overview outline of the approach, um, <clears throat> what, are the, what are the real principles for applying uh, the methodology? There's seven. I'm gonna talk you through all of them, almost all of them. Um, the first is design uh, leads the way. So we are not gonna rely on, um, on signage, for example, only. We're not gonna rely on enforcement for our streets, uh, but the speed limit is really enforced, but also um, dictated, determined uh, by the design of the space. And that means it's irrespective of the type of vehicle you're riding. A little example, I took this photo a while ago in the, in the, in the sand dunes in the Netherlands, um, which I thought was quite striking of how people talk about cyclists and they think about the person on the left probably in some countries in the Netherlands you'd rather be talking about the person on the right um, but these both are users of the same space um, and within this design philosophy they should be traveling at the same maximum speed that's compatible and that makes sure that the speed difference and the, the, the energy difference between the two modes is not too high and that comes back to the principle of safety if the kinetic energy is not too high, the difference between kinetic energies, then there's very little chance of injury. So you could imagine that in a, in a bike lane like this, which is approaching the, the center, town center, more of a restaurant center in, uh, on the beach, uh, you, could be, you could imagine that the, the, you would imply or you would impose a speed limit on a, on a bike path like this. Um, because it is, the, the speed should be dictated by the, the space that you're in and not by the vehicle you're driving or cycling riding. Then, uh, number two, the vehicle families. Um, we, we acknowledge that the current classification of vehicles in the Netherlands, or probably abroad as well, um, is not really up to speed with the current uh, evolution of electric vehicles that we see. Um, for example, scooters, e-scooters um, in some cities or some countries, they're seen as bikes. Uh, in some places, they're like halfway between the pedestrian and the bike. Um, here in the Netherlands, they're banned because there is no framework for it. There's no place to put them in the, in the system of vehicle categorization. So we acknowledge that and we said, okay, we cannot predict what type of vehicles will come later, but we can build a framework that classifies these vehicles, the, the vehicles that currently exist, but also the future vehicles, uh, based on their kinetic energy, which means their speed and their mass. This is the equation, if you went back, go back to your high school physics books, a very important equation in uh, traffic engineering, uh, one that's probably not often enough used. Um, but if you apply this, um, this, this type of thinking that you classify vehicles based on their weight and speed um, and their kinetic energy, then you get to um, a certain type of certain number of vehicle families, which are safe to lump together in one space and that can share a certain space. We've done that for um, six families. Um, these are the, the, 
the six vehicle families that we foresee for now, but also for the future. So any future developed uh, vehicle will need to fit into one of these categories to be approved for use on, uh, in the roads in the Netherlands. This is the proposal. So we have the pedestrians, like me, uh, no vehicle, maybe a hoverboard, that's still up, to, uh, <laughs> up for discussion, uh, but generally no vehicle and a, quite a low, uh, low speed. Then you have the bicycles with a vehicle that's under 35 kgs, which thus includes a cargo bike. Um, light motorized, ve motorized vehicles is probably the one that's the most interesting at the moment, where there's a lot of development going on, uh, but that really should be a vehicle that's under 350 kilograms. Um, and shouldn't go much faster than um, 30 kilometers an hour, but we'll get to that in the next slide. Then you have uh, vehicle family D, the cars, very traditional, uh, but shouldn't be too heavy. As you can see, 3,500 kgs. In some countries that is now called probably a light car. Um, and then there's the trucks um, and the rail vehicles. The rail vehicles are kind of separate because they have their own right of way by default or their own tracks and they can be guided around um, and controlled much easier. So if we look at, the, at how we plot these, um, these vehicle families and their kinetic energies, you get a graph like this. So in the green, um, pedestrians standing and walking, not very much kinetic energy at all. Uh, you can see the, the vertical axis goes up exponentially. So every step is 10 times as much. Um, kinetic energy as the previous. So you can see that the, there's a family of, of bicycle-like vehicles, which includes Segways, e-bikes, race bikes, uh, mobility scooters, um, based on their maximum speed and mass, and thus their kinetic energy. The light motorized vehicle family, there's only a few types here, but that's a, a fairly large and growing family that will see a lot of development in the future as well, and could also include, for example, uh, the, the very heavy cargo bikes that you see coming out now. Uh, they would have a, a slightly lower maximum speed, but a much higher mass, so it would still categor be categorized as light motorized vehicles. And then you have the automobile mobile um, family based on a very high maximum speed, which includes the motorbike as well. Then, number three. Um, finding the balance at all levels, how do, we, how do we put that into practice? It is fairly straightforward, um, but I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, for example, this um, is a, I won't name names, a random city uh, in North America. Um, and you can see that if you make a plan at this level, which we often do, a, a bicycle plan, for example, or a transport plan, or a car circulation plan, traffic circulation plan, um, that should have real consequences on the street level. Uh, what often, not in this city necessarily, but in what often happens in cities is that they, they make a bicycle plan, plant some bike, uh, bike route signs along the way and say, this is now a bike route, maybe put a shadow down, um, but that's not making a real impact for the safety of the cyclists on the road. So any, any plan that you make at a very high level, when you draw the routes on the map, um, that should have real consequences and should be visually reflected at the street level. That may sound simple, but it's something that we often skip or often don't realize how much impact that should have um, because those lines should meet something, mean something, and that is a, a, yeah, an important consideration. Um, this is an example of a photo that I took in the, in the US last year. Um, again, I won't name names about which state. Um, but this was obviously one of those places where they had a nice plan on a, on a map and said, yes, we can have a continuous bike route along the length of this corridor. Um, but then they got to the ground level and they figured out that there was a narrow bridge. This is a freeway with 50, 60 miles an hour speed limit. Um, and they just put a sign up that says bikes share the road, which is obviously neither possible nor desirable nor safe. Um, and that shows that those consequences that there should be when you say, okay, there's a bike route on the map that should have real life consequences, doesn't always happen. Then number four, and this is a very uh, important one, that is start with the spatial quality. Uh, don't, not, let not be the first question you ask when redesigning a public space is, oh, how many cars do we have through here? How many parking spots can we sacrifice? Do we need a separated bike lane? No, the first question is, what kind of place is this? Um, and that means you have to map uh, spatial quality within that space that you're talking about. 
and spatial quality can be a very broad uh, topic. It, it includes what kind of functions are there. Is it a shopping area? Is it a residential area? Is there a library, a school? Um, how do people how do people move or how do they use the space that, that's around? Uh, but it's not just about the, the actual physical attributes. It's also about the values and the qualities. Some people might really value that it's a very nice and quiet street. Uh, some people might like it to be more uh, hustle and bustle in their, in their street if they want. And those are those things you need to, to capture before you start designing. Uh, also the identity of the street. Um, do they think they belong to the city center? Do they think they belong to the urban fringe? Uh, do they think they're a rural place when they're actually maybe suburban? Uh, what kind of identity feelings do people have when they're talking about their place? Um, obviously location is important, uh, geographical location, and the relation to the surroundings, which means where, do the, where are the connections? Uh, where are the missing connections maybe? And how do we make it more connected to the rest of the uh, area. And that's not just about what the spatial qualities are now, but also if there's any untapped spatial qualities that we can unlock by redesigning the space. Um, and making this step one changes the conversation instead of saying, okay, we need 12,000 cars a day, um, because that's what the traffic model said. You start a conversation with, this is a, um, a market street where people do a lot of exchange and they value it as an urban area, for example. It's a very different conversation. Uh, we've done, done this uh, for an uh, urban, very urban street in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. Uh, and this is some of the output that we got from the public engagement process that we did. Um, we did a big workshop with a lot of residents, uh, business owners. And these are some of the terms that they, that they associated with their, with their own street. It means hip, lively. The big word is uh, urban street or city street. Uh, but also the one underneath it, the racetrack, uh, racebahn. Um, is obviously not a positive in this, in this case. There was a lot of um, nuisance from people racing their cars down the street. Um, so this was just a, quite a free form style of assessing the spatial quality. Uh, then we spent some time in trying to make the, 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 the quality assessment more structured. Um, and we came up with the integrated place assessment, uh, which is based on the PPS uh, place assessment, rate the place or the place game. Uh, we've taken that, but also added, uh, combined it with some of the transport aspects that we're looking for um, to give us a real good idea of how people value the, the way to get around it, but also how the place functions as a whole. Um, this will be available for download on the Mobicon Academy website as well, if you want to do it yourself. We are currently in the process of doing this with another one of our clients to apply it in the real world. Um, then we map that, um, those qualities. It's good to have them on a map um, where you put both the, the, the connections that you want and the connections that you have um, and, and put the location that you're talking about into the bigger picture of, of place assessment. So in this uh, Rotterdam example, um, the, the purple street in the middle, you can see that people felt that the, the eastern side was very much connected to the city center and should be better connected to the, 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 the city center district, which is the purple blob on the right. Um, but it kind of faded back into a residential area on the left. Um, but there were some real barriers that people felt, including the connection to the museums. <coughs> Sorry, it's very dry here. Then, the networks. And once you've assessed the, the space or place value um, to, uh, in the beginning, to start, in phase one, then you've got to assess the flow function of that space. How important is the flow for each of the types of vehicles that we have defined? Um, so we need to know how important is this um, in the pedestrian network, in the bike network, in the car network, in the light motorized vehicle network, but also in the truck network, and is there any rail transport through this place? And those networks, they all need to be defined, but they can overlap um, and they can be separate if you need, to, need them to be separate. So for example, it can be one section um, is a very important bicycle link, but another section may not be so important. Um, and this is also the time when you really start looking at the importance of the link that you're talking about in the car network. And can you create some space by maybe uh, tweaking the car network at a higher level to make sure that you have enough space for all the other network families that you have identified. So those strategic decisions made earlier on really are applied here to that space that you're talking about to make sure that all the networks have their space and are acknowledged before you start designing the street. 
So a little example uh, from a fictional and actually fictional town. We saw it earlier um, where we assess the place in the beginning <coughs> and now we're putting all the networks on the map. Um, so there can be a, a light motorized vehicle network, a, a route that's currently used for mopeds or for e-scooters or for cargo bikes. Um, that can be important. Uh, it can be a very important route for the cars. This is just the existing situation that we're assessing. Um, how strategically important are these networks? And once you've done that, um, then you can start to make choices or changes in the network where and if needed. We'll get to that later. And this is an example again from Rotterdam uh, where we took the strategic documentation on the, 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 the transport plan, the citywide transport plan for the city. Um, and we realized that yes, this whole space is important for pedestrians because there's a lot of shops, there's a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars, um, and it's a lot of transit, uh, public transport through this corridor. Um, it is a key bicycle route in and out of the city center. Um, it was identified as such in the bicycle plan. Um, it was also, well, it was not, not heavily used for light motorized vehicles, so the, the mopeds and the scooters. They often took different routes which were more comfortable for them. Um, and it was not identified as a key car route in the, in the strategic transportation plan, which was uh, a big bonus for if you're doing this kind of work, because that means that you can tweak um, the design of the street to create less space for cars, for example. So that's what that would look like. Um, and once you've done that, once you've applied all of those networks, then you start identifying, okay, but which one of these networks is more important than the other? Which one is dominant? And that will be the starting point for your um, street design process. Um, and that street design process starts with defining a category of street that you want this place to be. This is an example, or well, this is the, the, the framework in which that sits, uh, which includes a lot of com combinations of categories and speeds. So for example, uh, a bicycle street uh, would be a B20 street. So it's a street where the bicycle is dominant, but the design speed is about 20 kilometers an hour. Um, most of our streets now will be a D uh, 30, that should be 30 miles. Um, so a 50 kilometer per hour street designed for cars, that would be your standard North American or um, yeah, mostly North American street, uh, has a design speed of about 30 miles an hour or more um, and is based on cars as a dominant mode. Um, but by making it explicit that there is other options, um, you actually start to have a way bigger palette or a bigger toolbox of streets that you can design. And that's important to acknowledge and was uh, definitely something that was missing in the previous uh, design framework in the Netherlands. Um, so once you've uh, assessed space and flow or place and flow, uh, you, you start to try to merge these two things and see if, if, it, if it works, uh, what kind of speed, what kind of design, um, and is there enough space in the right of way to actually implement this? And that's where it gets interesting. Um, so in the, in the design methodology, it looks like this. So we've, we've assessed our place. We say this is an important urban street, a lot of exchange happening, um, great. Um, on the flow side, we said, okay, maybe it is uh, a key truck route. Um, maybe it is a key uh, bike route as well. Those things are not that well compatible, so we might have to make a change. But if we can fit it, if there's enough right of way, Sure, this, this could work, as long as we can design it in a way that keeps the bike safe, keeps the place accessible, um, and acknowledges the importance of the place to the local residents. Um, and that's where this comes together. You can see the arrows going back up, which means that um, once you've um, designed or tried to design a place in a certain way, and you figured that there's not enough space, um, there's not enough um, acknowledgement of the, the place value of the place, there's not enough room for exchange on the street anymore, something's got to give. And that means you have to go back and either tweak the network, so you can have the truck route take a side street, for example, or you have to acknowledge that, no, this is not going to be the great exchange place that we want it to be. Can we somehow remedy that in either a way of design, a way of acquiring a different piece of land, um, or just deal with the consequences and say this might not be the, the great street that we want it to be, but that's a result of the, the, the cho strategic choices that we made. So that feedback loop is very important. In the example uh, that we showed earlier in the, the, the fictional town, we, we saw that there's a, a car corridor going straight down the middle of the, of the town center, uh, which we said, well, that's not a good place for, for heavy flow, um, that's a place for place and it's a place that should have a low design speed of about 10 kilometers an hour. 
but a car network, a key strategic car network at 10 kilometers an hour is very difficult to design and it's probably not going to be either not going to be strategic car network because it's so congested or it's not going to be at 10 kilometers an hour which means it has um, bad externalities on the place value of the downtown which is a problem. So how can we remedy those choices. Now this is going to sound very quick and easy, um, and it is, but it does require some political strength. Uh, the first option is to just close down that street. You say, okay, no more cars here. This, uh, the place value is so much higher than the flow value. We want this to be a place place only. No flow for cars anyway. Um, no, fl no flow permitted. Uh, you close down the street, put some bollards in, a giant big rock on one side, giant big rock on the other side, done, it is now an open street, for example. Works in the really dense downtown environments of old cities. Um, you can uh, then on the right of that, you can say, okay, we leave it open. Um, we're gonna have 20,000 cars a day through there at 20, 30 miles an hour, or 30, 40, 50 kilometers an hour, fine. And we accept that that part of the city center is not really um, that important to us anymore. We acknowledge that the, the, the flow value is higher than the place value, and we're willing to give up that piece of city center for the sake of the bigger network. It's a perfectly valid option, but you have to be honest about it and have to acknowledge that in the design that no, we're going to design this for flow and not for place. So maybe the first initial place assessment was wrong or it's not gonna happen the way that we did. Um, the third option is if you say, okay, we'll allow access, um, but we won't allow through traffic, so you allow a little bit of traffic to filter into the place, into the city center, um, but you have not got a key a car corridor anymore. And then the fourth option, which is probably the most difficult option, is say, okay, we'll allow it as a key car corridor, but we will limit it to 10 kilometers an hour. And that requires a lot of heavy intervention in the, in the space, um, and it's probably going to make a lot of drivers very angry. So it's probably not easy and doesn't have the right outcome for your city, probably. Um, those those options, or it sounds really easy the way I say it, um, and I just want to impress on you that there is no silver bullet. This design methodology is also not gonna solve your problems for you. It gives you the framework to make these decisions, um, but these are still very difficult political, technical, or engineering decisions that need to be made. Um, within this framework, we give you more options to value things, not just based on level of service, not just based on number of cars throughput, uh, but by starting with the place assessment, we give, we're giving you the tool to start at, a, at, at the place before you start assessing the flow, and that changes the conversation in our experience quite significantly. Because if you just say, okay, we need 12,000 cars, oh, but it's also a very nice street, that's fine, but that's not something a traffic engineer can deal with. If you give them a place assessment where you structurally assess what this place is all about, and then you say, okay, we have goals in this field as well. And what are your goals in the, in the network field or in the, the flow field? You have a more balanced conversation. And that's what this methodology is all about. Then, uh, once you've figured that out, you've actually come to a conclusion that it works. You can have the appropriate place value that you want. You can still cater for the number of vehicles or the, the networks that you've identified. Then you can start actually designing the space. No earlier, no sooner than this. Um, that sounds late in the process, uh, but it is very important to go through these steps first before you start squishing it all in. Because if you, you can imagine that if you don't have those feedback loops and you st go straight to a design, um, what's going to happen is that you're going to try and compromise on each of the design elements before you even get to a, a solution that, that, that could become final. Um, and too much compromise, that means that everybody loses out, when maybe if you would have made one decision in either the flow or the place value uh, assessment, um, then you could say, okay, we acknowledge that there's not enough space to cater for the vehicles that we want. Um, you could have solved a lot of your problems and you would have saved yourself seven compromises instead of um, having everything squished to the bare minimum um, and just squeezing out a 1.2 meter bike lane, for example, on the road. Um, and then you start designing into several different domains. And what is a domain? Um, a domain is um, very simple. It is one physical part of the public space that you've designated for a specific design or a specific purpose. This street, one of my favorite streets in Amsterdam, um, it's got a tram down the middle, then a bike path, then a big grassy verge or 
planted verge, and then a footpath, footpath. So this would be three domains from the, out, from the inside out. So you start with a rail domain in the middle, which is an F50 probably, uh, rail vehicles at 50 kilometers an hour. Next to that, you have a bike at 20 kilometers an hour uh, domain. So that's a B20. And then on the edges, you have an A10 domain, which is a, a footpath uh, at 10 kilometers an hour, more or less. Um, so then, then you can make, for each of these domains, you can make a balanced decision on what type of vehicles you allow to mix and to separate um, within the street. Uh, within the street. And how that actually works, um, there's a lot more to that, but that is something you'll have to wait for the next episode when uh, my colleagues Evelyn and Martijn will explain um, how to balance those uh, design options for each of the domains uh, and when you can mix and when you have to separate different modes of transport from each other. That all sits in this last, these bottom two um, steps in the, in the design process. If you want to read up on it, um, you can download the, doc the, the document from <laughs> there <laughs> uh, in the download section of the Mobicon Academy. Um, there's the full report. It's quite long, but um, at, the, at the, the latter end of it, you'll see how that works. So you can read up on it if you want to do some homework before the next episode. Um, and otherwise, we hope you will join us then. And I have two more announcements. Next week uh, on Monday, I'll be doing another webinar with Evelina de Jong. I'll just be asking Evelina all the hard questions about roundabouts. Uh, if you still have a question, you can still send it in. No promises. Um, but this is in response to the previous episode about roundabouts that Evelina presented. We got a lot of questions that we didn't have time to answer, so we'll be addressing some of that. And we'll be giving you some more technical knowledge on designing roundabouts. Um, so that's definitely one to keep an eye out for. That's on Monday the 7th at 6.30 Amsterdam time. And then in December, um, we have a special promotion with the producers of Together Recycle. Um, if you join the Mobicon Academy, um, you get in December, you get a, a link to watch the new movie Together Recycle for free online. Um, and that one runs out to, at the end of December. So make sure you subscribe as a paying member um, and get your friends through it as well. Um, this is, by the way, the second version. So this is the follow-up of why we cycle. Uh, Together We Cycle looks at the history of uh, cycling in the Netherlands and how it came about. Um, so super interesting movie. And we will be doing another webinar about this um, in January. So with that, we've come to the end of my section. Um, if there's any questions, we'll be discussing those right after the break when we'll be back. And Melissa will be back as well. Thank you. how that was sort of a well laid out plan. Oh, thank you. Uh, every time you, I've heard this presentation a couple of times, every time you explain it, it makes a little more sense to me. So. To me as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the questions that we had from the audience through Twitter was um, just a bit of clarification around uh, e-cargo bikes and where they fit in, you know, specifically thinking of, for example, the Urban Arrow. Uh, yeah. They're quite large and heavy. Yeah. 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 So that's a, that, that becomes a tricky one because I, off the top of my head, I think it is about 35 kg, so it is getting getting quite heavy. And then it really becomes a matter of, of speed as well. Um, so how fast can it go, but also how fast do you travel on it? Um, the risk, obviously, with a cargo bike is not as big as with uh, heavier vehicles because the, the total kinetic energy is a bit lower. Um, but then it, the, the interesting thing becomes, okay, if, this is a, if these families get adopted, uh, the ministry is quite interested in the Netherlands, but they haven't gone that far yet, obviously. If it gets adopted as a regulatory framework, it becomes um, a, 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 a direction for producers of vehicles. So they will be able to choose what kind of vehicle they want to produce and then have the appropriate maximum speed uh, and weight to go with that type of vehicle. And that's when you get the real benefits, I think, for um, for this vehicle family's style thinking, mm -hmm. uh, because then you can say, okay, anything that has uh, is a light motorized vehicle or requires a helmet uh, and a driving license, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or you say, okay, driving license only needed from category D, 
um, and anybody over 16 can use an LMV or you know it becomes a bit more clear about what you're buying when currently it's like oh it's a it's a golf cart can I use it on the street <laughs> yeah. well, in, in the US sometimes yes you can but then it's like can I drive it when I'm 15 I don't know you know there's a lot of vague yeah. um, unknowns about what's the place of this vehicle on the street um, and arguably you could say that an e-scooter should be on the footpath if it wasn't going so fast but now there's no there's no useful framework for thinking about this, so that's why it helps, but it's definitely not a finished product. Um, and yeah, vehicles that are now falling kind of between the cracks, um, I think in uh, Urban Aero is okay because it doesn't go much faster than 25. Um, but for example, speed pedelec, or if somebody comes up with a very fast um, delivery cargo bike, mm -hmm. electric assist, that'd be like, oh, that's a little bit too much for that category. So then, yeah. You have to decide, do we allow it on the roads anyway? And do we rely on people to not speed? Because we'll put a speed sign up on the bike lane, which is what we do now with cars all the time. And we find that normal. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah. Or do we limit it and be smart about it? But then why would you not limit cars? So <laughs> <laughs> then it becomes a very <laughs> yeah. long process. So I guess um, one of the things that we can take from the vehicle family, so is it provides at least a, a base starting point, especially when exactly. I know some of the arguments outside of the Netherlands are that this le legislation doesn't exist or there's no qualifications for vehicles yeah. at the moment, yeah. um, even as close as in France, they struggle yeah. with it. Yeah. And so this at least becomes the groundwork or the exactly. recipe exactly. to start from. Yeah, and that's how you should look at it. This is not a, a finished graph. I mean, we only plotted the ones that are in the Netherlands on the roads right now. Um, you can extend that graph as much as you want, but it does, uh, thinking about kinetic energy as a driver or as a, as a the, the, the base, yeah, base reason for safety, because you, you, you use as a proxy, um, does make the conversation about, for example, bikes and bus lanes a lot easier, because you can be like, oh, should we put bikes in bus lanes? Well, the kinetic energy of a bus is mm -hmm. 100 times higher than a bike, <laughs> so no, that's not a good idea. Um, and before it was like, well, maybe, but you know, there's only 10 buses an hour. Is it okay then? Okay, how fast is the bus going really? You know, there's a lot of ifs and buts about doing it. And this just becomes a very clear numerical exercise where you say, okay, the kinetic energy of a bus is, I don't know, is it 100,000 kilojoules? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> a lot of zeros. And of a bike is 10, so no, you shouldn't mix those. And then it becomes very clear cut. I think that, that helps, it helps frame the conversation. Yeah. So a question that came up in the last session with Stephen and I was around um, where people should start in terms of um, how that, like in North America, for example, mm -hmm. what is a good starting point or to add, what should people be advocating for in terms of applying the good street principles? Yeah, I, th I think the easiest step and something that we've also seen that municipalities are open for is that place assessment tool. Um, because a lot of people are searching for, yes, we want to do things a little bit differently, but we're not quite sure how. Um, and by just giving them a framework to have a common language that you speak about what it means to have a place and what that place identifies and what kind of environment it should be and can be, um, I think that really helps to change the conversation and, and shift it out of the traffic engineer speak about level of service and AED and, and that kind of, uh, yeah, technical language that normal people have no concept of, but then you start to have a conversation about, oh, what kind of street do you live in? What kind of identity do you associate with that street? Um, and to have that as a, in, in your back pocket to say, okay, this is also important. We measure what we value. Mm -hmm. um, we, we measure the place value. And that can, you can make that uh, give people a ranking in numbers. And you have a num numerical system, traffic engineers really like numbers. Uh, so you're like, well, the place is now uh, seven on sociability, but we want it to be a nine because that suits the location. And then you can be like, okay, how can we, how can we get to a nine? Well, you can't get there if you have 20,000 vehicles a day going through it. So then you start to be, yeah, you put more framework around that discussion instead of just letting traffic engineers speak traffic engineer and the placemaking people speak fluffy placemaking language and nobody <laughs> understands each other. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I guess, well, building on that too, um, it's funny, I remember a few years ago, someone referred to an MUP. I'm like, what the heck is an MUP? And I've been working in urban mobility advocacy for a while, but it meant nothing to me. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, the idea of the multi-use path, and actually leads to another question we had from last week about like that idea of um, mixing. But yeah, using the language yeah. that makes sense to people is a yeah. good place to start, obviously. Um, but then I know a lot of conversations come up around the mixing of bikes and pedestrians, at least in a, especially in a North American context. Mm. That's what I came from. Yeah. Um, and how would we then apply the, like, would we look at having different domains in those scenarios? Would that be preferable or is there a way for the two to mix? Yeah, there, I, I'm kind of dipping my toe into next episode as well, because that's, that, 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 that we're really going to apply um, those mixing mixing vehicle families, but in principle, you can say um, everything in the lower bottom left half of that graph of about kinetic energy. Uh, that graph is so important, but anything in the bottom half, the kinetic energy is not really that high, and the differences are not really that high. So they they can technically mix safely. So safe, safety is then less of an issue. Um, there's very few recorded. Um, injury crashes between bikes and pedestrians globally it very seldomly happens and then it's big news mm -hmm. but it's a daily occurrence in every country uh, that a car hits a pedestrian and it's fatal and it's normal it's not even in the newspaper anymore um, but because the kinetic energy is so low it, it never really becomes a safety issue but then it's a com comfort issue so I'm not that comfortable with a bike racing past me at 20 kilometers an hour, even though I know I'm not going to get hurt, it still startles me. So then yeah. even within that framework, which is a, um, it's difficult to have a conversation, can we share bikes and pets in the same space? But the framework gives you the tools to at least take the myths away that it's going to be dangerous because you know the difference in kinetic energy is not very high. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be dangerous, but we can still have a conversation about if it's comfortable or pleasant. Well, then I guess it comes back to that idea of designing for the types of spaces that you want. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And if it's a big, if you if you find this, in, if it's a very key route on the bike network, for example, or for long distance commuter cyclists, then maybe they will not appreciate it, and the, the the flow value will go down if it's a shared path. But when it's a nice park area, and you want it to be all about place and mixing and meeting and hanging out with children and playing then yeah, then it's okay because you should suppress the flow value a bit mm -hmm. and having a shared path is a great way to do that. Um, I wrote down another question um, around actually the vehicle families in terms of um, are they regulatory? Is it something yeah. that is mandated? <laughs> no, no, not yet. Um, the current status is the first, so we've been working on this project for quite a while. Um, it has been discussed in Parliament as a, a motion, and there was uh, a lot of interest from the Ministry about developing it further, but also seeing how we could apply it. Um, so since then, we've done a few pilot projects um, to see how it would work, um, the, the, whole, the whole design um, philosophy. And it has worked really well. Um, there is a lot, it takes a lot of time, we need a lot of water under a bridge before this happens, but it does seem to be gaining traction again. So we hope to see it become regulatory in the future, but that's going to be a, a, a wee while away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess then that's all the questions we have, but I thought maybe you could give a little teaser of what people might expect when Evelyn and Marcin present yes, next yes. month. Yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll put a little bit of pressure on them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, the, so we've discussed now how to, how to value the place in the flow value or how to evaluate um, how much place value a place has, how much flow value a place has, how does that come together, um, and what high level considerations have you, have you got at that level. Um, if we zoom in one more step and we really start to talk about cross sections, then we get to the question about can we mix uh, bikes and buses? The answer is no. Um, but can we mix cars? Okay, at what speed can we mix cars? How do we design for cars to be traveling at that speed without needing a speed camera on every little corner? That kind of stuff. So you really start to, to zoom in on the, the, the toolbox of street design options that we have in the Netherlands and some that we don't have yet, but that we should have. Um, and Evelina and Martijn will be discussing those options, the palette of, of colors, I like to call it, that we can paint our public spaces with um, and what the upsides and downsides of using various different design approaches are um, to get as much out of your right of way as you can, um, while maintaining the place value, obviously. Um, so that's what they'll be talking about. That is in 
January. The, it'll be the first webinar in January. First webinar in January. <laughs> um, fingers crossed. We just have to double check schedules, you know, around the holidays. We never know who is here and who is not when. So stay tuned. But right now we anticipate it'll be about January 6th for that webinar. That is one of the uh, free webinars included in the Intro to MobiCon Academy session. So uh, those of you who are on our free subscriber list, you will have access to that one. Uh, next week's session qualifies as premium, so that actually will only be available to those that have subscribed for Friends of MobiCon Academy, so our paid subscription. Um, so if you haven't already and if you're interested, please do level up and subscribe to that. And you'll also have access, as Leonard mentioned earlier, to the download stream for Together We Cycle. So for that, uh, if you subscribe by the 15th of December, you will receive a link on the 16th so you can enjoy Together We Cycle over the holidays. Um, and then we will have more study tours and much more to come in 2021. Uh, so we hope to see you for all of those upcoming sessions. Cheaper than Netflix. Cheaper than Netflix, somebody Amazing. keeps saying. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so with that, thanks, Leonard, again, for a great presentation. Thank you to our team for keeping us well organized from behind the scenes. And we will see you again next time.